Hello, everyone, and welcome to Chevaliers Online. Um, we're so happy to have you with us in this virtual space. Um, just a quick note before we get into the conversation, we ask that you please keep your microphone muted. Um, there will be time for an audience questions at the end of the evening where you can raise your hand and speak or you can drop questions in the chat. But until then, please make sure your mic is off and just leave comments or reactions in the chat until then. And for now, I'd like you to join me in welcoming our guest tonight for a discussion of the glorious American essay. We have with us the editor of this collection, Philip Lopate, who probably needs no introduction, but I'm going to try anyway. Philip is the author of To Show and Tell and four essay collections, Bachelorhood, Against Joie de Vivre, Portrait of My Body, and Portrait Inside My Head. He's been the recipient of many awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship, two National Endowment for the Arts Grants, and two New York Foundation for the Arts Grants. He is in conversation with Dinah Lenny. Dinah is the author and editor of five books, most recently Coffee. She's a core member of the faculty of the Bennington Writer Seminars and an editor at large for the Los Angeles Review of Books. And we're so, so thrilled to have both of us with us tonight. Um, thank you again for joining us and take it away. Thank you, Kelsey. Hi, Philip. Hi. <laughs> 10 o'clock here in New York. Really. <laughs> Sorry, say that? It's 10 o'clock in New York. I was going to say it's pretty late there. How do you feel? Yeah, <laughs> ready for bedtime. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. Well, I'll try not to put you to sleep, though. Um, so nice of everybody to come. Thank you for coming. And thanks to Chevalier and, and to Kelsey for the lovely introduction. Um, Philip and I were talking just before you all arrived on my screen here. And I, um, I thought maybe it would be nice if I asked him if he would read a, a, a little piece of his introduction to the Glorious American Essay, which, by, by the way, you guys, have you seen this book? It's... It's beautiful. It's, it's really beautiful. Um, anyway, I, I sort of picked a, a paragraph here, and, and Philip said he would be willing to read a paragraph to us. Yeah. After talking about the, um, um, the history of the essay as it developed in the United States, um, I had part two, and I said, but wait, what is an essay? Many definitions have been proffered None conclusive. Samuel Johnson called it, quote, a loose sally of the mind. Marilyn Robinson said it was thought in the pure enjoyment of itself. Chris Arthur wrote that an essay is a literary electrocardiogram that traces out in words the pulse of thoughts. And an essay arranges words with one eye on sense, one eye on style, and a third eye on wisdom. R.P. Blackmer called it a form of unindoctrinated thinking, making it especially well suited to doubt, inconclusiveness, skepticism, and contrarian views. Note that it necessarily, not that it necessarily has to be inconclusive. We deduce from all this that it has something to do with tracking thought. Some have maintained that the essay must have an argument must instruct. Others, that essays must not do either. <laughs> no instruction, save through the medium of enjoyment, lazily along with... Philip, I better jump in real quick. I think we're having an issue with your mic. What's the problem? Um, you're, you're cutting out. Cutting out? Yeah, you're cutting yeah. out. What can I do to not, to not cut out? Um, are you by any chance holding your book over your computer? Yes, okay. I think you're accidentally hitting the mouse and it's, it's muting yourself. Okay, I'm going to start again. Thank you. Um, well, what, what is an essay? Many definitions have been proffered, none conclusive. Samuel Johnson called it a loose sally of the mind. Marilyn Robinson said it was thought in the pure enjoyment of itself. Chris Arthur wrote that an essay is a literary electrocardiogram that traces out in words the pulse of thoughts. And an essay arranges words with one eye on sense, one eye on style, and a third eye on wisdom. Bobby Blackmer called it a form of unindoctrinated thinking, making it especially well suited to doubt inconclusiveness, skepticism, and contrarian views. Not that it necessarily has to be inconclusive, 
We deduce from all this that it has something to do with tracking thought. Some have maintained that the essay must have an argument, must instruct. Others, that essays must not do either. According to Agnes Reptier, quote, it offers no instruction, save through the medium of enjoyment, and one saunters lazily along with a charming unconsciousness of effort. That is one kind of essay, the informal essay, which depends less on reasoning than on authorial voice. What Elizabeth Hardwick called the soloist personal signature floating through the text. But what about the formal essay? Doesn't it, doesn't it too need personal style of a sort? Many have tried to limit the field. William Dean Howells drew a, a strict border between the essay and the article. William H. Gass forbade the scholarly paper from consideration as an essay. Cynthia Olda wrote, quote, a genuine essay has no educational, polemical, and socio-political use. It is the movement of a free mind at play. A genuine essay is not doctrinaire tract or propaganda effort or broadside. Thomas Paine's Common Sense and Emile Zola's Jacques are heroic landmark writings, but to call them essays, though they resemble the form, is to misunderstand. Okay, was that clear? Did you hear that? Yes, it was. That was great. Now, um, that's a good place to start because one of the things I wanted to do was to challenge all of these views and, and to expand or extend the range of, of essays. So for instance, when I read Cynthia Ozick, and I will say that I think she's a great writer, one of my favorite living writers, I disagreed. I thought that maybe a pamphlet could be an essay. So I, I, I read Thomas Paine's Common Sense, and I took a piece from it. Um, I, took, I took some articles, despite the fact that uh, William Dean Howells had said the article is not an essay. He, he was trying to to distinguish between journalism and essay writing. And this is one of the things that always happens with an art form, which is there are people who try to, to say, pure film is X, or, you know, um, pure, uh, um, you know, pure nonfiction is Y, or whatever, you know? So I really wanted to, um, to look at things like sermons, for instance. Um, I put in uh, Jonathan Edwards' Sinners in the Hands of an angry guard, and I also put in Martin Luther King's anti-Vietnam War speech, because it seemed to me a, a really good essay that was questioning itself as it went along. Um, I put in a letter, like um, I put in letters by um, Frederick Douglass and Sarah Grimke. Um, so I really wanted to um, to make people think about the essay is a very fluid form that could turn up in a lot of different ways. Uh, and that was one of the ways that I tried to, to extend the range of the essay. Uh, so, yeah. so Philip, tell us, when did you, when did this selection process begin? And, and did you know right away, okay, I'm gonna, I can't do this in one volume. I mean, wh when did you realize how ambitious this project was going to be? Probably not at the beginning or I never would have undertaken it. I mean, <laughs> It was a huge project. And so what happened was, I said about um, reading and researching. I thought, um, somewhat arrogantly, that I knew the field. Because I did a lot of the personal essay and, and I'd, I'd really um, done a lot of work with essays over the decades since. But it turned out I had, I had many, many gaps. Um, and some of those gaps had to do with um, you know, reading preferences. Like for instance, um, I never read George Washington's farewell to the troops speech. Um, but then I read it and I thought, wow, this is a really good essay, you know? <laughs> um, who knew, you know? Right. Um, so there were, lots, there were lots of gaps and I started compiling lists. And I, I, um, I ended up with basically a book that was about 1200 pages long. And the publisher said it can only be 850 pages long. <laughs> Um, so, so was, was it at that point that you started to decide that you decided about the three volumes and 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 tell us about the three volumes because they're I mean it's interesting this volume does sort of go all the way on, up to the present almost the present yes. moment, but the next volume is the volume that will actually cover the contemporary essay as I understand it so, so tell us more about the, how you've divided your effort here okay so 
I was tr I tried to get the publisher. I thought, forget about um, practicalities, forget about profits. You know, I, I've got this big fish at the end of the line. I know what it is. I I, I could really do it right. And every anthologist will tell you that um, they always want more pages because they know they're going to be attacked for leaving out X, Y, or Z. So they think, if I got more pages, I could please everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so so um, I turned in this big manuscript. I whined and wheedled and tried to get my agent to put pressure on the publisher. No dice. They said, look, 850 pages is about the size that, that you can... Um, find something comfortably. Um, and that's what our designers want to do. So I couldn't change their mind. So I sulked. <laughs> um, and, and somehow the publisher said, okay, I thought maybe they'll give me another volume. They gave me two volumes. I didn't even ask for two volumes. So and when, at the point that they gave you two volumes, did you think, oh no, I can't fill this or, oh, this is very exciting. I'm going to have a ball. I thought, this is an adventure. This is very exciting. This is going to take five years, which it did. Um, and by the end of it, I'm really going to know this field. So, and, and is that, when, how, so when will the other two volumes come out? How will that okay, work? So, so the first one just came out. Right. The second one is coming out in, um, in April um, 2021, which is just a few months away. Right. And the third one is coming out in August 2021. All of them will be within a span of a year. Now, the second one was much more focused. It's, it's called The Golden Age of the American Essay, and it's 1945 to 1970. Um, and what happened was that there were lots of essays that I wanted to get into the first volume. Uh, but of course, I ran out of space. So, the, but, the, but there was something interesting that happened in that period. Uh, we know, of course, that there were lots and lots of of magazines and periodicals, um, and that it was a very exciting time, and 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 America was feeling very high in itself, and it was also what Lionel Trilling said: there was a kind of liberal consensus. This was before McCarthyism, you know. There were a few years where everybody seemed to agree, that, um, and and it was a very um, kind of a tolerant period. There were lots of movies and books about. Um, the follies of anti-Semitism, the follies of racism, and, and the whole family of man photography show, which basically said we're all part of the same family. Um, so it occurred to me that there was a kind of uh, overlap between uh, liberalism and the ideology of the essay, since the essay is, is sort of um, undogmatic, uh, as R.P. Blackman said. Um, so I thought maybe this, maybe this was why it was a very good period, uh, very inviting of the essay. So I put in a lot of essays um, that, that came from that period. And, and, um, and, I, and, I, and in that period, I showed how uh, basically uh, liberalism was, was ascendant and then it was challenged. And all of the limitations of liberalism, you know, came out through the the persistent problems of American society, you know, which have to do with, with, with race and class, imperialism, um, the environment, and so on. But it sounds um, like that second volume is sort of emblematic of the best of the American experience. Um, it's certainly, it's certainly, um, it's an argument in effect. Um, you yourself are making an argument with the, with the collection, with the anthology? I'm making the argument through the selection. I see. How different people um, um, face the, the, the topical problems of the day and their own, their own psychological problems. So yeah. then, Philip, how, tell us how you moved. I mean, I'm, I'm, I have a million questions about the first anthology, but I'm, I'm very interested now to know how you moved into the third one right. and, and where you see the essay going. Right. So the third one, which is basically the new American essay in the 21st century, um, which it's, it's probably going to be um, more popular than the second one, because everybody always likes contemporary anthologies. Mm -hmm. I was somewhat scared to do it, because I knew that I would make a lot of enemies. 
<laughs> because of leaving people out? Leaving people out. Yeah. Um, Are you done? Is, you, I was also scared because, because some of the hot young, young essays I didn't love. They seem more trendy than, than wonderful. Uh -huh. uh, and, and this is the most difficult thing in doing an anthology is that um, it's the, the fun part, the easy part is the, the old historical stuff because you already know what's, what's, what's lasting. Mm -hmm. As soon as you get to the present moment, it's very myopic. You can't really see it clearly. You can't really distinguish it that clearly. Um, but, but I ended up having a great time with it. I found so many good essays. And, and when you when you talk about sort of the the trends of of the essay now, uh, and and that you like some of them, and but that you don't like others, can you talk about the the trends that you're seeing that you like? Well, every, I mean, if an essay is well written, I'll forgive anything that it's doing. That it's doing, you know. Um, so I mean, there are obviously a lot of essays um, about identity. Uh, is you know minorities and individual and, and minority groups whether whether racial sexual or so on disability they 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 define their identity through the essay it turns out to be a very very good tool that minorities have always latched onto um, and and you know the problem is is a kind of rewriting that that maybe sometimes doesn't get enough of a sense of the individual writer. Um, but then you have people who are, who are qualifying their identity. Um, you know, they don't want to become, let's say, uh, the spokesperson for race or, or, um, or a sexual orientation. They want to show how they, they, they agree and don't agree. You know? So there's an essay by, by Richard Rodriguez uh, called Hispanic, um, in which he talks about, um, uh, actually, that's in the first volume, in which he talks about uh, what is it to be Hispanic, you know? Uh -huh. And we know from the recent election that lots of people who, who speak uh, Spanish and English don't identify with this uh, umbrella type Hispanic, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one thing. There are experimental essays um, playing with the form. Um, How do you feel about those? The, the hybrid essays, the experimental essays. Were you able to include some of those in the in Yes. The line? Yeah. Yes. Like I included an essay by, um, by Hilton Owls in which he, um, he pretends to be Louise Brooks. Uh -huh. It's actually an essay, but it's an essay through, through a, another persona. Um, and I include an essay by Anda Munson about failure, which is splattered all over the page. Uh -huh. um, makes sense, but you know, it's doing a lot with, type, with um, typeface, you know. Um, so, um, you know, and I included people like Maggie Nelson and Eula Biss, and, and even and Sven Burkers, <laughs> uh, who's watching in now. Um, anyway, um, I had a good time with it. Now I'm going to confess to this uh, audience one of the problems with this three book arrangements. Um, it's that there's a gap missing. The years 1970 to 2000. There's nothing there, you know. I couldn't do a whole book with them. I put some of them in, in the first volume. But um, the thing about it is that I love this project, but I also, um, you know, I always, I, 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 I have a lot of pain about the things I had to leave out. Even though I ended up getting um, 900 plus 700 plus 700. How much is that? 1,400, 2,300 pages. That's a lot of pages. A lot of pages. It's a monumental undertaking, you know. And, and during that time, were you reading anything else? Were you reading anything but essays for the last time? Reading, certainly reading a lot of student work. <laughs> um, and, and, um, and friends with, who were novelists would send me their books, you know. Um, right. And now I'm rereading Proust rather slowly, I have to admit. Um, but, you know, I, I, I love to read, so, you know, a day when I don't read really feels um, constipated in a way. And, and what about writing, Philip? Were you writing during this time as well? I was. I was writing, I was writing individual pieces, some personal essays, uh, lots of criticism, book reviews, film reviews, um, and also um, 
these three um, introductions and all the head notes. Right, right. You know, I'm going to open this up in a minute, but I just wanted to ask you before I do. Um, I, I love that you know, in this, it, it, this during these precarious times, that you've written this kind of um, three part. You you've delivered this kind of three part ode to being an American and what it feels like to be an American. And I wondered if you could talk about that just before I open it up about, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, even to call the first volume the glorious American essay was, um, was something of a, of a provocation because I know that, um, you know, I spent my whole life uh, as a kind of, um, what, uh, liberal progressive or left liberal and I know that most of my friends in that, in that group um, have very little good to say about America. Um, so it's, it's sort of like a, a secret, but I actually do feel somewhat patriotic and I do love this country. So I can't help it, you know? I've been to many, many countries. I've done a lot of traveling. And so, you know, you get a sense of, well, America is definitely, definitely not the worst. Um, so, but I also felt that it was, it was a good opportunity to, to reconvene the American idea. However, it may have uh, proven imperfect, unrealized in, in, in all its particulars. The fact is that there was a kind of great idea and that it was a great experiment. Um, and uh, there's a lovely essay in the first fire by Wallace Stegner called The Twilight of Self-Reliance in which he says, don't give up. We've only been around for a few hundred years. We still got time to, you know, to correct some of these things. So um, I was fascinated. I was fascinated with American history as as it showed itself through these essays. Uh -huh. On one level, it's a it's a book about a literary form. On another level, it's a book about American history. Um, and that 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 really that really um, interested me more and more, especially as I saw that the problems we face now, immigration, race, um, um, sexism, uh, and so on, um, income disparity, these were recurring problems. Or, or democracy as something that's not just a, an empty form, but something that's, that, that's real. You know, I included an essay by, by John Dewey called Democracy in America, where he basically is saying, um, Classrooms have to become more democratic. We have to, we have to um, get the students and the teachers more involved instead of imposing this top-down curriculum on everything in this rigid way, you know? Um, and then I have an essay by, by Emma Goldman, who of course was this anarchist firebrand, you know? Um, so sort of saying, did I waste my life, you know? And she, she also has a kind of love is quarrel with America, you know? Um, uh, and so, so there was an opportunity to, to investigate all this material, you know, not in a jingoistic fashion, um, but, um, but, but let's try to figure out what this American idea is, you know? And, and do you feel hopeful about the, the essay as a form? I mean, obviously it's elastic for you and, and it's a big umbrella, but in, in, in the age of social media with Twitter and with Facebook, I know you don't do that stuff, but you, you're aware that people, that everybody's weighing in on everything all the time. Um, and, and how do you feel about the future of these forms? I think the essay is, a, is a really a very um, a useful form that's been around for centuries, um, millennia, really, ever since the Greeks and Romans. And so it's a cockroach. It's not going to go away. You know, you're not going to stamp it out. Um, there'll be periods when it's, uh, when it's um, uh, much less highly thought of, doesn't have the status of the novel and the poem, but it's also, it will endure. And then I don't think that, um, that the internet is necessarily a threat to the essay because um, there are good blogs and bad blogs, you know? Mm -hmm. um, one can write with a great deal of, of, of style and personality um, on a blog as much as um, uh, write mediocrely, you know? Like any form, there's going to be a lot of mediocrity and there's going to be some really good stuff. So well, in, the contem in contemporary one, I put in something by Eileen Miles, which was a blog. I put in something by Ross Gay, which was a blog. 
Um, so it's an opportunity, you know, so I don't see it as, a, as, as um, an opposition. And, and you, the, did you include something, the thing that you included from Ross Gay, was it from the Book of Delights? Yes. Yeah, I, I love the, the short form stuff in that book. It's yeah. wonderful. The idea that you can do something that short and, and, um, and score, and let's pack say. Pack a punch, yeah. yeah. So yeah. tell me one more thing, and then I swear I will open it up to everyone else. But I, you know, I, I, I realized earlier tonight when I was looking at the book and getting ready to meet with you, um, Philip was my teacher at one time, um, so I, and I've been following this work really, this this oeuvre since the art of the personal essay, and I I suddenly wondered I've never I've never asked him when did he personally discover and fall in love with the essay, and I wondered if you could sometimes we can point to a piece of writing that just like for me I think it was um, once more to the lake that made me realize what this form is. Yeah, it's a perfect essay. Um, what was it for you? For me, it was um, one summer, um, I had been writing uh, novels and poetry. Um, and, and, and basically had no interest in the essay. Although I wrote this book, Being with Children, about my work with kids. I thought I was writing chapters, but now I realize I was writing individual essays. Anyway, um, I, was, I was staying, I was, renting a, a cottage in Wellfleet that belonged to Dwight McDonald. And I was going through his bookshelves and I, I saw this book by William Hazlitt. Um, and I took it out to the hammock and read it and I was completely, that was my road to Damascus, you know. <laughs> it was like lightning. I loved his voice, cranky voice, very, mm -hmm. very idiosyncratic. And he, he, he talked about his friend, Charles Lamb. So I read Charles Lamb. They both talked about Montaigne. So I read Montaigne. Um, awesome. By the time I read Montaigne, I was completely hooked, you know, completely hooked. And then, I, and then I also thought that the essay was a way that I could, I could bring over the things I did in, in fiction, which was narrative, essentially, and the things I did in poetry, which was association. Mm -hmm. I once had this kind of... Uh, debate with John DeGatta, uh, who who's kind of very interested to into the lyric essay. And, and we were asked what we thought the essay was essentially, and he said it was associational and I said it was narrative. It had to, it had to tell a story, if only the story of the track of one's thoughts. I, 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 I think it's both. And so then it became a form um, that, I could, that I could use. And it's funny, my, my my novelist friend said, you should keep doing this. Almost like they wanted to get me off of fiction. <laughs> <laughs> keep doing this, you know? Um, and so I've, I'd always loved the, the sound of the first person voice, you know? Um, intimate, talking in my ear. This is the greatness of Montaigne, you know? You feel, even though he was writing in the 16th century, that somebody is personally talking to you. Yes. So I fell in love with a personal essay. And I did all of the personal essay, but then I started to realize why, why restrict it just to the personal essay? Why not critical essays? Why not formal essays? You know, they also require personality. Right. Did you, I wonder if there's anything in any of the, the, the um, anthologies that isn't written in first person. Um, I'm, you know, I'm thinking of, I'm thinking of human relations, you know, right. the Natalia Ginsburg uh, essay that's written in first person plural. Um, and I'm thinking of people who write in second person. Did you include anything like that in any of these? Of course. But, you know, even in the other personal essay, if you watch the pronouns, you'll see that um, very often a writer will start off saying one or we, and then get around to I, and right. then go back to we. Because it's a game in which you, you move from the, from the particular to the general. Um, and part of the whole attraction of the personal essay is realizing that it's not just about you, that you are um, emblematic of a much larger pattern, human pattern. And that's the magic, yeah. Well, listen, Kelsey, I think I should um, give other people a chance to ask Philip questions, don't you? Yeah, let's start. Yeah. Um, so there are really no rules to the Q&A, but you can either um, raise a hand via the Zoom feature, or if you're on camera, just wave an arm, and we'll help you unmute to ask your question, or you can drop it in the chat. 
And I'd like to actually start things off with one that was sent um, in the chat a little earlier tonight from Sarah, who asks, um, her favorite essayist was Gore Vidal. Do you see someone at his level and breadth today? My favorite essayist was what? Um, Sarah's favorite essayist was Gore Vidal, and she's wondering, do you see yeah. someone at his level and breadth today? Gore Vidal was a great essayist. Um, and um, I think he was characteristic of a whole group of American writers who were better at essays and memoirs and nonfiction than they were at their fiction, even though they wanted to think of themselves as novelists. Um, is anybody writing now um, at the level of a Gore Vidal? You know, part of the problem is that uh, the whole notion of the public intellectual um, has gone through a kind of sea change. And um, in, the, in the 40s and 50s, there were many, many writers who, who set up shop as public intellectuals, um, one of which was Gore Vidal. Um, and then there's sort of um, some kind of um, humility took hold, um, or I think in a way, the public intellectuals did such a good job that the generation that followed, which is essentially my generation, um, felt a little reluctant to, to pontificate. Um, and, and, um, and we also felt that we knew our own experience, but we didn't, we didn't know, um, you know, we couldn't comment on things that, that, that we hadn't seen with our own eyes. Susan Sontag went through this problem. She certainly is a great essayist. Um, and she, she, because of her political position was at times suckered into making statements that were very broad and that were, that were um, not necessarily substantiatable. So she ended up saying, until you go to the place, you know, um, don't mouth off about it. Um, so I think that um, there's less of a of, um, tendency to, to make these broad sweeping statements that in Govidal was really, he had the kind of classic, you might, you might say Ciceronian rhetoric, you know, a formal rhetoric. Something else that has happened, and now I'm really digressing, is that if you look at the essays that were written in, the, in, the, in, in America in the 40s and 50s, um, they, they, all, they all had a kind of formal intellectual tone. However, however aggressive they were in their ideas, um, they, they, they were showing off a certain kind of um, cultivation. And then in the mid 60s and beyond, you started getting the breakdown of this, um, uh, this kind of texture. And you started getting people like Hunter Thompson and, and Tom Wolfe, um, uh, Edward Abbey, who, who were really kind of like um, giving the finger to the formal essay. Um, so, so, so Vidal was really old school in the sense that he was, he was still very, um, a very classic rhetorician. I hope this is the kind of answer. It's a great answer. Great. Uh, we have another question, and it's actually for both Dinah and you, Philip. Um, what are you reading right now? Well, I'm reading Proust slowly, um, and um, uh, I just read a book by Dorothy Gallagher that was sent to me. That I liked a lot, um, which she wrote to her dead husband. Um, and um, uh, read a book of poetry by Carmen Bayosa. Um, I'm always reading different things, you know, um, and sometimes I don't finish them. Um, and let's see, I'm reading, I just finished reading a, a, um, a memoir called I Am, I Am, I Am by Maggie O'Farrell, because I had read Hamnet, which I really loved. Mm -hmm. um, and when I, when I spoke to some students about loving the, the novel Hamnet, her novel, her recent novel, one of the students said, well, you must read her memoir. So I just finished that and I, I really did, I, I liked it very much. Um, and I have on my, uh, over here, I just got for my birthday, Obama's memoir. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I might dip into that. Um, yeah. and I to read a, a, a different stuff too. So I have a couple of plays on my night table and, and one of them is a play called Lungs 
uh, which I saw at the Old Vic. I just got a play that I liked a lot called The Flick. How was that? It was really wonderful. Yeah, and, um, and wonderful to read, right? It's fun to read plays. Yeah, it was really good, Annie Baker. It was really a good play. Okay, I'm writing um, my... So yeah, I, I can never stop reading uh, fiction and poetry. And to me, they all feed into the same, you know, the same lake, so to speak. You know, I once asked, um, I was at a reading and I, and I was, went to hear Laurie Moore read and, and I raised my hand and asked her what she was reading. And she told me, you know, in front of this big crowd of people at the Los Angeles Public Library. And then she said, what are you reading? And I was completely stumped. I, I couldn't remember a single book. I said, um, student work. Right, of course. Anyway. I have a funny story about that, which is, uh, uh, Susan Sontag, who I knew, came down to the University of Houston, where I was teaching then. And um, she, 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 was, she could be very uh, contemptuous when she thought she was not in one of the main arenas. Um, and so um, she asked her students uh, what they were reading. And they, they, they froze, you know. Um, but I, I happened to know those students. So they were reading, because I had assigned it, they were reading... Uh, Goethe's Journey to Italy, they were reading Walter Benjamin's book on Baudelaire. They were reading all this really Susan Sontag high-class stuff. Um, but, but some of them were Native Americans and they, they weren't used to showing off, you know? So she thought, oh, there's a bunch of dunces. <laughs> you do when people ask you that question, it's funny. Yeah. Anyway, what else? Well, there was another question I saw down here. These, these chat, these... Um, these questions come and go. Yeah, we've got a, another question who asks, um, are there particular characteristics you'd attribute to the personal essay by era? Um, for example, the personal essay in the 60s versus 90s versus today. Are there prominent trends or differences? Yeah, there are differences. Um, one, one difference I think I'm generalizing about the current moment is that um, It used to be that the personal essay, the personal essay felt he or she had to have a sense of perspective or detachment on, on experience in order to render it. Um, and I think that now there's um, some of the confessions are more raw and, 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 they, and they, they seem to convey a sense of being in the midst of confusion. In other words, there, there isn't an attempt to um, to dissipate the confusion, there's, a, there's sort of like um, an invitation. You're confused, I'm confused, let's be confused together. Um, and, and um, you know, so that is very much the hallmark of a period of, of uncertainty. Um, there's more tolerance towards, um, towards that kind of um, um, not being able to, to see or understand what it is you're going through. I think it used to be that 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 in the in the fifties, let's say, there was more of an attempt to to get on top of the experience. So you used to get someone like Mary Mary McCarthy's On the Contrary, which is a beautiful book of essays, and she's always trying to to judge herself in effect. You know, Philip, talk about that on the level of the of the long form, the 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 book length essay too, because it's interesting. I I just finished reading. Um, Sigrid Nunez's What Are You Going Through? Yeah. Which is a novel, but it feels like an essay to me. Do you know it? I haven't read it yet, but I know that Sigrid is, is, is a very essayistic kind of fiction writer. Right. Um, and, and a lot of that, I mean, it's a first person narrator and there's a lot of reflection between the lines and, uh, uh, you know, between the, the narration is broken up with reflection. And Yeah, I think, I think one of the things that's happened is that fiction writers have become envious of the essayist's ability to, to, to think on the page instead of just doing this indirect thing where show, don't tell, where you, where you can only um, kind of um, arrange a, a narration and then the reader's supposed to get the ideas, you know. But in the 20th century, there were always certain writers like, um, well, uh, like Proust, like Robert Musil, um, uh, who, who, um, who wrote a very essayistic kind of uh, 
uh, a novel. Um, uh, Milan Kandera talks about these people. Um, uh, Roberto Bolaño, you know, they wanted to be able to put their ideas in. Um, now, essays really are drawn more and more to the, to the, the long form essay. The long form essay is very, very tricky. Um, and we see how, for instance, um, We see how, for instance, writers like Susan Sontag and James Baldwin move beyond the 20-page 20, 20 essay into uh, these books like um, On Photography, Illness as Metaphor, or, or Baldwin's, um, you know, uh, The Devil Finds Work, and so on. Um, so uh, Edgar Allan Poe once said, a poem, no such thing as a good long poem, you know, they can't sustain themselves and so on. Um, but, you know, the, the long essay, like a long poem, is inevitably uh, more imperfect than the short essay. Um, you can do something in a short essay like, like uh, E.B. White's uh, Once More to the Lake or Virginia Woolf's Death of a Moth. You can nail that thing, every word. But as soon as you get into a long essay, and I think Baldwin was, was a characteristic of this, um, he... he um, he sometimes lost his way structurally. And then he, he, had to, he had to come to a conclusion and he would say love or he would say apocalypse. He'd do something that came from his preacher days, you know. Um, but really it was a structural problem. But- Do you call a favorite length yourself? Philip, do you tend to sort of come in at a certain length when you're writing an essay? Yeah, I think, I think something like between 20 and 25 pages. Between, 12 and 25 pages, let's say, would be a perfect essay for me. Susan Sontag reached the point where she, where she said, I'm spending five months on these 20 page, page uh, essay. This, this is ridiculous. But see, what I think is that she really, she mastered that form, you know? So what she did then when she, she would go off into this kind of, um, you know, like illness as metaphor basically pushes an idea further than it really needs to go. And then years later, she, she corrected it and said, well, of course, that's not really the whole story. You know? So she would argue with herself, but not within an essay just 10 years later. Talk about the, the difference between a book length essay and linked essays. Do you think it's like linked stories? Is that, do you have a I mean, yourself, would you put, would you be more inclined to do one or the other, to do a collection? Of I love the idea of, 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 of random collections, you know, which, right. which, where you experience the writer. If you like a writer, you really want to know what he thinks about almost everything. And the idea that they don't all have to be about literature or film or, or politics or anything like that can be a mix, you know. And that's what, you know, collections in the 40s and 50s were like. Everybody accepted that as a form. They liked that form. But then essays became for a while unpopular and publishers started um, reconfiguring them, pretending that they were all one theme, which really made for a Procrustean bed. You know, you couldn't always make every one of these essays seem to be um, another chapter in one theme book, you know. Um, so what was your question, Diane? I'm not sure, you did it. What about your coffee? Uh, your book on coffee. That's like a long essay. It, 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 in a way, I think it is sort of a, a book length essay, but a, a very little book length essay. But, 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 but there are standalone essays within it. Um, I was, it terrified me to write, to write that book, that little book. I was very frightened of it. Because, I mean, what were the structural uh, you issues? Know, what, there were structural, um, there were structural things, but I think what it, part of it was th was um, was that I had to give myself. I had to remember that I didn't need to be an expert on coffee to write the book. That it wasn't going to be that the book was going to be about me. It wasn't going to be about coffee. You're a connoisseur, if not an expert. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> but it's interesting because it's it sort of brings to mind the the whole sort of Jeff Dyer thing about being a gate crasher. Which, I mean, the, the joy of being an essayist should be that you can write about anything you want to write about and you don't have to know a lot about it to sort of dive in. 
Exactly. I mean, I know you, you write about film, you write about books, you, you, you write memoir. Um, my book on Waterfront was essentially an extended, uh, extended essay. Right. Tackling the problem from many different angles, yes. Yeah. Do you have a, a, a project in mind now, um, essays wise? That you'd want to is there would you just do you should it just be the collected essays of philip lopate or is it you know another kind of waterfront ex exploration what are you telling me three books is not enough for you i um, I, I want you i'm 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 sorry i think i'm looking for a book from you i'm enjoying you so much in the book that i want another book of philip lopate no i have i have a lot of i have a lot of i uh of um essays um literary criticism and film criticism that I've written that have not yet been collected. So as soon as this, uh, this trilogy is, is, is uh, published, I, I plan to go on to that and to figure out how to cut up the baloney this time. Hey, I, I know what I'd love to ask you about. I, I mean, I'm sure other people, you guys chime in with some questions here, but I'd you love to- make Dinah do all the work. Yeah, you're making me work so hard, but it's kind of, I mean, it's so much fun to have you, you know, all to myself on the other hand, Philip, but um, because everyone else is muted. But I, the other thing I sort of wonder about is teaching the critical essay, because I know that that's come up a lot for, you know, I work, I teach at the, in the Bennington writing seminars, and the sort of big bugaboo at the moment is how do we teach the critical essay? Um, how personal should it be? Uh, Tell me about how you approach this with your students. Well, I throw tons at them, you know. When I edited the, the book, American Movie Critics, I told myself that, that a good movie critic is writing, in a way, uh, a personal essay. Um, and, and that all, all good critical writing conveys a sense of, of self behind it. So let's say if you read Lionel Trilling or you read Edmund Wilson, you don't necessarily, um, they don't necessarily talk about themselves and their private life, but you, you sense very strongly what these people are like, and Susan Sontag. So, you know, I throw a lot of stuff at them. Um, I, I taught a course uh, with Margot Jefferson. We, we co-taught it. It's a wonderful course on um, uh, theater writing, film writing, dance writing, music writing, and, and visual arts. And I took three of those things and she took the other three. Uh, you know, and when I did visual arts, I went all the way back to, to Diderot, you know, um, and I did Ruskin, you know, and, and basically all different kinds of styles um, that, 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 would, that would convey, how do you look at a painting and, and, or a building, you know? Um, and start to, to take this nonverbal form and put it into verbal uh, language, you know? So, so as usual, the, the main method I use is what could be called saturation reading. Make them read a lot. Um, but then try to, try to analyze how they are creating a persona behind the criticism. Um, you know, to, to write, for instance, to write a movie review, um, a movie will last usually an hour and a half to many more hours, but there's so much to talk about. Should you talk about the acting, the directing, the photography? Um, should you talk about the careers previous to this movie or any of these professionals? You know, uh, should you talk about the genre? You know, so you have to find a point of attack, and the point of attack is essentially the essayist gift. How do you set up the frame of a piece of criticism? so that it is in effect um, a little essay. Do you feel like there's some ingredient to this business of teaching the arts that, that cannot be taught? Do you ever find yourself sort of feeling that, okay, it, I mean, does somebody have to come with to you, for instance, with a voice? Is that something, can you give somebody that personal sort of authority if they don't have it? Um, I think you. I think you can. I think you can make writing students better writers. I really do. And how it happens? Um, if I were a scientist, I could figure it out. But for instance, at Columbia, where we teach now, 
the student sent them in the first term, by the, by the fourth term, they become better. Some of it may be just peer pressure, competition, whatever, you know, or just seeing models, oh, you could do that. I didn't realize you could do that. Mm -hmm. So I think you can make them better. Um, there's no question in my mind when it comes to essay writing that there are some people who are meant to be essayists. Um, and that's a combination of strengths and weaknesses. Like, you know, um, they, they know their own mind, let's say, but they couldn't create characters in fiction that would be memorable characters. The best character they can create is themselves on the page. Right. Um, and then there's this, this element of, of detachment, you know, which, which may be unpleasant for your family, but which is very suitable for essay writing. So yes, yeah, so there are people who, you know, like I can tell sometimes, you know, that there are people who they get it and they want it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it was, it's interesting. Um, I was, I'm thinking of the, there was a beautiful essay in the New Yorker last week. Uh, Young Lee wrote a, a beautiful essay, mm -hmm. uh, something about how to cry or how not to cry or- yeah, Grief, yes. The grief essay. Um, and, and in that essay, she talks about um, how much, how selective the nonfiction writer is, how much the right nonfiction, there's an implication that the nonfiction writer is leaving so much out. Um, and I, I wondered, you know, with your own, with your, with your own work, uh, particularly the memoir um, that you've written about your mother, about your father, mm -hmm. um, I know people sort of tend to think that they know you very well when you're an essayist or a memoirist. Do you, are you selecting, are you leaving lots out? Do you, or do you feel that you've bared it all? No, of course I'm leaving some, some stuff out. And, and then there's a paradox that um, in some ways, I'm a rather private person and I don't always tell things to people. You know that. Yeah. Um, Montaigne once said, things I would never tell anyone Anyone can go down to the bookstore and find out about myself. <laughs> so, um, but certainly there's a selection process. Um, there are some things that I, that I don't write because I think it would, it would hurt somebody, you know, uh, that I care about, um, or hurt me, let's say. Um, and so you can never tell everything. My sense is that um, I like this idea of the, the one book writer that keeps, he keeps adding, like uh, Whitman's Leaves of Grass, you know, or, or Proust, you know, um, essentially one book that keeps being added to an editor. So, so, so one way of looking at my work and you said collected, you know, is that um, in a way, it's all the same book and, and, and different, different pieces, different angles, different slices. You know? So, um, Hillary. In other words, just you can't get your whole self down on the page necessarily on, on, on one page or even right. in one piece. But eventually, if you keep writing, um, you know, you get a fairly three dimensional portrait. Right. And, and actually, I was having a conversation um, earlier today with a student who um, he's he's a wonderful writer, but he really, really want he really, really feels that we have to have every part of the story that if that he's so he's making so many connections all right. the time. And he's afraid that 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 we'll miss a connection the word that if he misses a connection the story is less full and and you know and and this man happens to be a psychiatrist and i i said to him you know yes my therapist has 25 years of context but she i couldn't have given it to her in one year and you can't afford to bog your reader down in 25 years worth of context so it's a, yeah, it's a this, this, this is one of the characteristic problems of, of memoir and all autobiographical writing is that you you go back and then one thing connects to another and you're swamped. You don't know how to how to um, limit uh, the scope of what you're talking about. This is where writing fiction actually is good practice for writing nonfiction because you begin to say, well, there is a story here. I don't have to tell everything. Right. Right. So Hillary said that, that she's enjoying, she doesn't have any questions, she's just enjoying the conversation. But if you guys were in front of me, if we were in a room 
I would be saying to you, come on, ask him questions. He's, he's here on the screen. He's here for your, Lynn Fried used to say she was here for our delight. He's here for your delight. Ask him a question, you know, cause I'm having a wonderful time, but I want you to have fun too. Hello? I have a question. Oh, good. I feel like this is cheating. Um, but what do you um, think is next for the essay? Like what is the essay, what is next for the essay? What form will it take? Or do you have any hunches of where it's going to go from here? You know, um, so because, I, because I'm taking the historical view, so much of what pretends to be new is not that new. It's been done before. So I think we'll, we'll keep seeing these shufflings of things that have, that have been done before. Um, there's no question, I think, that um, that the personal essay has come to dominate the essay. That even even academics, you know, now begin a a paper with two pages about their childhood or something. So it's almost like there's been a recognition that um, that if you're not a specialist in a field, um, you're going to need some authority and the main authority you have is over your own life story. But of course, there will continue to be, um, there will be experts. There will be great science writers, you know. We're going to need them more and more. There will be doctor writers, you know. Um, you know, in, the, in, in, in this book, I, I have a whole bunch of um, nature writers and, and science writers. And, they, and certainly environmental writing is going to be bigger and bigger. So I have, I saw, I have Audubon, um, I have John Muir, um, Rachel Carson, uh, Edward Abbey, uh, scientists like Lauren Isley, who's just a fantastic writer, uh, Lewis Thomas. Um, so I think that um, there will continue to be this question of where is the writer's authority coming from? Why, we, why do we want to listen to this person? Um, you know, and if maybe, Fauci wrote an essay, I would certainly read it. And maybe what will happen to Kelsey is that people will just, I mean, what Philip said is so true that, that people have been doing this stuff for years and years and years and that there's nothing really new um, unless you sort of count the social media influence, which, which is certainly an influence, but maybe what we'll do is just come up with new names for the old forms. Like, you know, fiction isn't, you know, autobiographical fiction is suddenly auto fiction and, right. you know, I mean, maybe we'll just come up with new names for things that we've been doing all along. You know? Yeah, there was a question about, is there a, a, some kind of fatal mistake in some personal essay writing? I don't know if it's fatal, but it's near fatal, I would say. It's essentially self-righteousness. Um, if you write an essay that's, that basically is, is uh, defensive and is saying, I was the only one who was sensitive and intelligent and everybody else was a bozo and they hurt me. Um, it's not, it's, it's gonna be like a, not a very promising essay. Um, you have to be willing to, to show your, your complicity in, in, in all the pain of the world, you know? Your own betrayals, not just that you were betrayed. Um, so, so being willing to, um, being willing to uh, being unselfrighteous is very important. But I do think that, um, that it's probably impossible to, to reach a point of um, total clarity unless you're you know, a, a saint or a Buddha or something like that. So all essays will have a, an element of defensiveness and rationalization. And so then that, that's what makes them an impure form, a blessedly impure form. So... Um, so yes, if you if you can um, accept that there will be a, an element of, of, of defensiveness, but you try to work against it, that's important. Well, that that's a, I mean, unless there's another question, that's a perfect place. Oh, there's another question. Yay! Hillary. <laughs> um, Hillary, uh, she says she's interested in what periodicals both of you read or peruse. Um, and what's the net you cast to read non-book works? What's what? 
what's the net you cast to read non-book works? What else, what else do you read that's not necessarily just a book? Well, I do read magazines. At one point I was, um, I was editing this thing called the Anchor Essay Annual, and I read um, hundreds of magazines They were sent to me. Some of them don't realize that I'm not, no longer um, editing it, so they keep sending me these magazines. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know, I usually read um, uh, things like um, the London Review of Books, um, the TLS, the New York Review of Books, N Plus One, um, Hotel America, uh, Fourth Genre, um, what else? Um, American Scholar, um, The New Yorker, Harper's, um, and um, Plowshares, whatever, whatever they send me, I usually look at it for something that I, that I, um, Agni. Huh? Agni. Agni, exactly. I always read Agni. Um, final question, I think. Um, to what degree do you simply go into an essay without, a, a, without a, an argument or a point? I think, I think it's important to have some aspects of of the essay open that you haven't figured out yet. If you figured out everything by the time you write an essay, it's going to be dead on arrival. Um, there should be some question that you're asking that you haven't figured out yet that you attempt to, to answer in the course of the writing. Or maybe you're just noodling around and thinking, I don't know where this is going, but let's see. So there are experiments. Um, but what happens in my, in my experience is that as you start to write, after, after a page or two, you start to get a sense that there is an argument or point that's forming. And then you know how to support it. You can feel it growing underneath the, the open-ended exploration. The two things are happening at the same time. I, I want to ask you one more question, and, and then you can go to sleep, because I know it's late there. Um, but I want to ask you about revision. What happens with you and revision? What's that process like? Revision is where you get smarter. Um, you know, uh, generally my, in my first draft, I don't censor very much. I write everything I can think of. I overwrite. Um, and then I, then I start to cut back. Sometimes when I write a piece, I think I want to make this one point. And I write the whole piece and I realize I've forgotten to put in the one thing that I thought I, I should have done, you know? So then I put it in. And in revision, I also can, um, can draw connections. You know, not everything has to be indirect or tip of the iceberg. Sometimes you can actually tell the reader what it is you're trying to say. So in revision, I, get, I, get, I tend to get more explicit. Um, the other thing is that uh, I try to polish the language. I try to make it a little more sparkling. Because at first, I'm just trying to get the ideas down. You know, Thoreau said that he wasn't very interested in style. Um, he said he wasn't interested in style. Thoreau had a great style. So maybe he wasn't interested in because he, 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 he could do that without even thinking. Um, but um, I do try to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to agonize like Flaubert, you know, oh my God, I use the same word twice in two pages, you know, <laughs> but I am going to try to, I'm going to try to make the style a little bit more lively. And usually that, that turns out to be a kind of process of concision, taking baggy sentences and, and, um, and squeezing all the water out of them. <laughs> well, that's a great image to leave us with. Um, Kelsey, I, I think that's, are there any more questions? I think no that's more it. questions. I we think this is a great. And go, it's nearly the witching hour there, or it's going to turn into a pumpkin or something. Philip. May I recommend that you buy the book? Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> this book is fantastic, you guys, this book. I'm, I'm having such a good time with it. Thank you for coming to California and talking to us about it, or wherever you are, if you're not in California. Um, that's this kind is of my best. third or fourth time at Chevalier Books. I love that store. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I know this to be true. Virtually. Yeah. 
Kelsey, thank you so much. Thanks to Chevalier for hosting. Thank you both for joining us. This has been thank fantastic. And again, please, please buy this book. It's truly wonderful. Good holiday gift. It really is the best. I'm so happy to have mine. I recommend. All right. Thanks, everyone, and good night. Good night.